I don't think Professor Cecilia Bolt needs any introduction here. I mean, she is a um, um, professor here at UCL and um, she has also been to Princeton and uh, so she is a very prominent uh, theorist and she will be giving um, a comment on with the title The Return of Political Theology, uh, The Scarf Affair in Comparative Constitutional Perspective, Turkey, France and Germany. So, um, I mean, that is, of course, a very important um, and timely uh, debate, as because I come from Germany. I mean, there is, I, I know that very well. But I should shut up and give the word to you right away. So 15 minutes each, and then we have uh, half an hour debate. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. <clears throat> I must confess a lot of uh, admiration for Sheila at this, at this point of the, uh, of the afternoon, because uh, resilience and uh, uh, sustenance in answering questions is quite quite remarkable so well done to you you, you can you, I think you deserve a rest at some point I'm not sure we've been able to give one to you but um, so I'm going to comment on, on the chapter uh, called uh, titled uh, return of political theology in the scarf affair in uh, Germany France and Turkey now I, I wholeheartedly agree with uh, everything that Sheila says about the scarf affair and I would like to focus my comments on, on the notion that appears in the title of political theology now. This notion has come into prominence in certain academic circles and it's obviously relevant to this controversy as uh, Sheila's chapter very nicely uh, suggests. So the question I want to ask is, uh, is the scarf affair <clears throat> about a return of political theology? And I want to do three things. First, I want to clarify what political theology is. Then I want to ask what it means to talk about a return to it in relation to a scarf affair. And finally, I want to ask whether we need uh, political theology. So let me start by setting out three theses about political uh, theology. So generally speaking, when people write about, talk about political theology, they, they mean it, uh, they intend it to, as a critique of the separation between religion and the state, and as a challenge more generally to secular liberal political <coughs> thought. And notably, it's two tenets that the stake is broadly an agnostic about theological truth and that religious groups are free to exercise the rights associated with freedom of religion but they must refrain from imposing their views on others by the state. So I want to set up three, three versions of what I call three theses of political theology. The first one, so I call thesis one, uh, is the state, uh, I've not found any catchy word. So, this is one, is um, this, something like the state defines and controls religion. That's one way to schematize it, something like this. Um, so, this is one would be state defines and secular state is indifferent, agnostic, or even tolerant vis-a-vis -vis religion. Why is this, you might ask? Well, this is because the secular state defined itself in relation to religion and contributed to define and shape the latter. Now, this is a thesis that's been developed by historians, uh, people like William Kavanaugh, for instance, but also anthropologists, such as uh, Tal al-Assad. So they challenge the rather enchanted liberal story of the emergence of liberal toleration out of the religious wars of the 16th and 17th century. And they point out, rightly, that the state that emerges out of the religious wars is in fact an absolutist state which asserts its sovereignty over religion by defining and in fact inventing religion as that, that which is divisive and irrational. It's a state which tightly controls which religions are acceptably official and which are not. 
to think Anglicanism in England, later Gallicanism in France. And it's a would-be sovereign state which forces the privatization of churches and the confinement of so-called religious questions to matters of private conscience. Right? So it's not a state that tolerates something that was already there, it's a state that creates religion and gives it its space and its fear. This state becomes liberal and tolerant much later, but it still exhibits the structure of this great separation to this uh, the term of Mark uh, Lilla. So for these historians, there really is no paradox in a secular states defining and controlling religion. That's what secular states do from the start, because that's how they define themselves. So from that point of view, Turkey is no different from the USA, France is no different from Germany, they all have a similar path to secular modernity with national variations. So that's thesis one. Thesis two, so by saying, well, look, there's no separation because religious groups make political claims. <clears throat> and in particular, they challenge the secular boundaries enforced by the state, and they challenge the public-private distinction. So examples of, of this, you might think, historically were uh, the areas of education, social welfare, family law. Throughout the 19th century and beyond, secular states sought to define them as issues of public interest, and therefore they should be controlled by the state, and they sought to take them away from the group of churches. Churches naturally thought that education, the family, and social welfare was within their remit. They were religious, not secular. So you have a transfer from religious to, to secular. And, and of course, churches challenge this. So one way of interpreting the conflict between clerical and anti-clerical groups was a, con a conflict about the boundaries of religion within a particular national uh, institutional setup. So that's the second thesis. The third thesis, as you can see from the double arrow, is uh, much more radical. Um, and this is the, th the thesis associated with Karl Schmidt, um, which, uh, according to his phrase, uh, all political concepts are theological concepts. And the actual quote which Schiller uses is, uh, all significant concepts of the modern theory of the state are secularized theological concepts. So clearly that's a more radical thesis because it denies the autonomy of the political, which was the starting point of thesis one and two, right? So one example that Schmidt gives is uh, sovereignty. But you can't understand the very idea of sovereignty in the West unless you understand it as a theological notion. Uh, it's a sovereign law giver. So in every state, there is an agent. There has to be an agent that has unsupervised and irrevocable authority over the people. So clearly the idea of the sovereignty of the state was modeled on the idea of the sovereignty of, of God and the category is exactly the same. And from that, that point of view, I, uh, I, um, Sheila writes that um, Schmidt's theory of the exception is, is, a, is a different idea and it seems to me it fits, it fits quite neatly into this, this political theology in, in the following sense that if you think of the sovereign as the one that set the order but also can break it. And not only he sets the order for a given universe or society, but also he's not bound by it. So he's very much like a god performing a miracle. So the exception is the ability that God has both to set the order and to break it. Uh, and so it seems to me, I'm not sure that's, I'm not an expert on Schmidt at all, but it seems to me that we can understand the theory of the exception as part of the political theology. Okay, so three theses. Now, what would it mean to talk about the return uh, of political theology? So obviously, return means that so something there at the start, and then it kind of faded or disappeared, and then it's coming back. I think the idea of return would have different implications for the three theses. So I want to say something briefly about each of them. And I want to illustrate the claims uh, by reference to the scarf affairs. So this is one. Lots of people talk about a sense in which today, secular states are forced to become theological states 
in the following sense. There's a sense in which a, uh, the state and its agents, notably judicial authorities, are called upon to take position about matters they would usually rather avoid, but that actually are unavoidable, so as per thesis one. Right? So because the action of the state penetrates more and more into private areas, family more and more, sex, education, and also because increasing, there are increasing religious demands on the state, but also the transformation of religion with more pluralistic, less organized, less dogma-centered form of religious life. Because of all that, judges have to deal with new freedom of religion claims, which involve them deciding what a religion is, what is religious and what is not, and what is essential and what is peripheral in a religious doctrine. So recent examples in, uh, <clears throat> just give you a couple of examples from the uh, recent UK judicial decisions on education, so as independent schools, religious schools, so some, some schools claim that uh, corporal punishment had to be seen as a, a, a reasonable interpretation of Christian doctrine, and so you had that unusual um, uh, position that the House of Lords found itself had to decide whether corporal punishment was part of Christian doctrine and so that in effect had to engage in theological judgment. Um, more more, more well-known case is the case of the Jewish free school where the question was can a Jewish uh, school use an ethnic criterion of selection of its pupils? Right? So is it acceptable to have an ethnic criterion for who counts as a Jew? And again the courts had to get into this complex questions about what Judaism is. Closer to uh, a topic uh, in this chapter, is wearing the hijab, is that a religious obligation? Is it a cultural practice? Is it a political practice? What exactly is it? And clearly, the answer to this particular question, which I'll focus on now, depended on national context. And here it's quite interesting how each country hawked back to its own political theology as per thesis one. So as Sheila very well uh, uh, brought it out, um, so in Germany the hijab is construed as a political sign because it's alien to the Christian culture of the state. In Turkey it was construed as a political, system, political symbol as well because as, a, as, a, as a, an Islamic threat to the, to the secular republic. And clearly the... Is it too, too loud? Sorry. Yeah. Just shouting at you. <laughs> Don't take it personally. <laughs> So the fear of Islam as political is clearly uh, common to all countries. But I want to say something about in what, the way in which the national context mattered as to when the hijab was seen as religious. Just two small points about this. So what's quite interesting, you compare France and the UK, for instance. So in France, the hijab is typically presented as an infringement of, of laïcité. So in response, it was very important for the Muslim women and girls to claim that it's not a religious sign, right? Uh, you, you wear the hijab not, not because it's a religious obligation, not because your religion asks you to do that, but it's a personal choice, a matter of choice. Right? And the usual interpretation of this is to, people usually say, well, it's quite interesting. It shows the French Muslims are, are uh, more, much more republicanized. You know, they, they speak the language of, of freedom of choice, and which is really interesting. I think there's something to that. But also, there's a kind of discursive path dependency about saying, well, we don't want to be, to, it to be religious because if it's religious, we can't wear it in the secular public sphere, right? So it's partly strategic as well. Uh, and conversely, in the in the UK, um, so cases of. Um, um, <coughs> exceptions to uniforms in school, but the only way you're allowed an, obje um, an exemption from a school uniform is on religious grounds. So the opposite was true. The British girls, there was an interest for them and the community generally to say, well, it's actually, it is a religious obligation. It's compulsory. Because if it's simply cultural matter of freedom of choice, then you don't have any Article 9 kind of claims. And in this country, freedom of religion turns out to be more protective than racial equality claims legislation. So that, that, that I, th I think it's quite an interesting, if quite weak, but still an interesting sense in which national political theology shapes uh, national political debate. So, so much for thesis one. Thesis two, um, 
Well, I think this is the common sense understanding when people say, talk about, oh, there's a return to political theology, that's really what they have in mind. It's, it's thesis too, right? So it's the claim that uh, religious groups are more and more behaving like political actors, religious arguments have, have gained a greater salience in po uh, political debate, uh, etc. So sociologists write about the deprivatization of, of religion and um, many point to the new assertively political claims of religion from uh, the, the, the field of education, the teaching of science, for instance, ethics, sexual morality and the family, but also political violence and think of terrorist attacks, but also a greater democratic visibility of religious believers generally. Now, is this a return? As I was suggesting in my gloss on thesis two earlier, I'm actually not sure that the boundary between the political and the religious was accepted and settled before. If you think of the conflicts about education and the family and social work in the 19th and 20th century, it clearly wasn't settled. There's no such thing as a clear boundary. Um, but what is true, and I think Sheila is absolutely right to say that what is new is this massive phenomenon of the deculturation deculturation and transnationalization of, of religion. So as you talk about deterritorialized, de thank you, transnational, televisually mediated, and sometimes electronically transmitted religion. And this very interestingly unsettled political theology in the, sen in the sense of thesis. One, right? So there's deterritorialized, oh, I'm not gonna manage that, deterritorialized groups, challenge the claims of political theology of thesis one, right? Uh, so state sovereignty is challenged by the fact that religious claims are more and more transnational. They use the language of human rights. Um, the hijab in this context will not be seen as tied up to a local practice of Islam, but will be seen as a, as a, as a, uh, as a universal identity marker as a Muslim wherever you are. Uh, in the world, so it's not a traditional hijab, but it's a very modern uh, hijab, and here I have in mind uh, Olivier Roy's writing about so religion without culture. And you can see how within the jurisprudence of Article 9 within the EU, there is an attempt to make sense of the emergence of trans transnational norms of religious freedom. So I think there's an interesting tension here between thesis one and thesis two, and I think this is what you bring out in your, in your chapter where you talk about both, you know, at the same time, the deterritorialization of religious claims and the assertion of national norms of management of religion. So we have thesis one and thesis two at the same time. Now, what can we say about thesis three? Well, it's more problematic uh, to talk about a return in the context of a Schmittian thesis because um, as far as I understand him, um, Schmidt's <coughs> conception of political theology is a transhistorical, kind of structural claim about the state. Um, uh, so he wants to say that, I mean, it's, it's quite unclear whether it's actually specific to Western thought, but it's a structural feature of the Western state that it is thero theological. Right? So insofar as sovereignty, order, the state are theological concepts. So that's quite a radical thesis because if the state is theological, there is no autonomous secular order and there is really no distinction between the religious and the political. And if in addition that theological is specifically Christian, then secularism is only a form of secularized Christianity and it, it loses its claim of being relevantly neutral towards other religions. So from this perspective, the hijab controversy is not a return to political theology, but what it is, it, it lays bare the structure of political uh, theology. <coughs> so on that view, non-Western minorities are asked to become secular in the public sphere, but in fact what they are asked to do is to comply with an alternative political theology. So one, one example here to illustrate what the critics have in mind, in, Many people point out that the hijab <coughs> is an embodied religiosity. And this is in tension with a Christian or at least Protestant ideal of an interiorized and privatized religiosity, 
which is in fact associated with secularism. So of course there is a misfit between the hijab and secularism because of the Christian political theology on which secularism is based. So that's the claim. Which takes me to my last, uh, to my last point. Do we need political theology? I want to argue briefly um, that um, one and two are plausible, but I think three is more contestable. <coughs> And I think thesis three is, a, is, is plausible as a description of a historical fact and as setting out a conceptual equivalence. So the sovereignty of the state is modeled of, on the sovereignty of God. But I think that doesn't mean that all political language is still just theological. I think what's missing from the debate about political theology is a debate about what theology or religion actually is. So the claim easily collapses into a genealogical claim or political concept come from theology, but it seems to me this is either trivial or wrong. It would be trivial because this is true of many concepts. If you think of a language of science, universities, the arts, all languages have theological roots in that vague sense, in the sense that the pre-modern world was religious through and through. Religion was everywhere, therefore nowhere. It's not a distinct sphere of thought and action. So, so saying that something is religious, sorry, saying that something has a religious origin is not saying anything interesting at all. Now perhaps the claim is, is narrower than this. Perhaps the claim is that specifically modern political concepts are modeled on theological ones. So sovereignty, order, the exception. So theological here seems to be bound up with a absolutist Hobbesian view of uh, the world, of the political world. There are two problems with this. The first one is democratic liberal ideals of constitutionalism and limited government are also theological in the sense that they were developed within Christian, Muslim and Jewish thought throughout the Middle Ages. And secondly, you might think that Western political thought is not only Hobbesian and ideas of limited sovereignty, democratic government and checks and balances are still theological in a Schmittian sense, probably not. The point is that political concepts have evolved and we have, what, what we're given here is a historical model which doesn't give tools to understand what happens when concepts are secularized. To conclude, I want to suggest that thesis one and two are more plausible, but they're not incompatible with secular political thought. So they're more, they're more modern, they're, they're too modest theses. And despite the uh, extravagant claims of some of their opponents, it seems to me that political theology in sense one and two is not necessarily a fatal blow to secular political thought as I defined it at the start. So if this, un if this is understood as working with a specific narrow conception of what a religion is, broadly speaking, in Rawls term, a comprehensive controversial conception of the good life, then the basic idea of secular thought that it's wrong to enforce any of these through the state and liberal states roughly are those who don't do that this is not thrown into question by thesis one and two so they do not upset the secular state on thesis one the fact that the state has to define what religion is for political and legal purposes doesn't mean that it ipso facto becomes a theological state it doesn't promote a comprehensive ideology or expect conformity with it on thesis two the fact that a religious group makes claims of recognition doesn't mean that they wish to impose their view on others or to shape the political order in accordance with their theological views. This is my last sentence. So political theology is, uh, in this sense, compatible with the secular order. But political controversies such as the Scarf Affair are not instances of political theology in the stronger Schmittian sense, which is often implicitly invoked by advocates of political theology. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for this um, very um, uh, careful uh, commentary and bringing in the historical material. and. Listening to you, I mean, it opens up the discussion in such a uh, good way. Listening to you, I was thinking to myself, could my answer to Catherine be something like this? I think the trouble is the title. Let me go back to the title and do three things. The return of political <coughs> theology, question mark, the scarf affair, 
in France, Germany, and Turkey. I go back. The return of political theology, return in inverted commas, column, the scarf affair, etc. Or I go, the return, question mark, of political <laughs> theology. Okay. Uh, I just want to say, I just want to say first that um, uh, I used this advisedly. Uh, you have now convinced me that um, uh, I really should put a question mark there, either after the term return or between the first two, because uh, uh, I uh, completely agree with your uh, criticisms of um, uh, Schmidt, and in a way, I discussed them in the first part of the article uh, to say why is he being invoked so widely in this debate, because what we are dealing with today is in fact uh, this phenomenon of the deterritorialization of religion um, in many, many cases. And um, um, I consider the thesis about the genealogical thesis, as you put it, a thesis in the history of ideas. Um, the thesis about sovereign is he who decides on the exception is a thesis both in political ontology and constitutional theory. The constitutional theory aspect may turn out to be more interesting. Uh, um, I am not a Schmidt scholar, but there were certain contexts within which he developed this thesis uh, that are worth you know, examining um, more closely. And then uh, there is a third dimension of the term political theology, which is uh, legal, um, uh, which is about legal hermeneutics. Uh, so I don't think that there is any disagreement at all. In fact, I'm you know, grateful to you about pointing out that uh, one has to pro problematize you know, uh, Schmidt's um, usefulness. I mean, why should political philosophy have to resort simply to this concept to talk about the issue? So your more systematic uh, claim about the formation of the modern state, um, uh, whether it's thesis one, thesis two, or thesis, um, uh, thesis uh, three. Um, historically, it seems to me that you know, you're quite right. Probably thesis two, historically, is the more accurate narrative description of all modern state formation. And it is uh, thesis three, namely the mutual um, interaction um, uh, of both the domain of the political and the domain of the religious that is really crucial now. But let me, you know, within this context this of, wide, um, of wide agreement, um, let me try to raise uh, uh, some, uh, some further uh, uh, questions about about this. Um, why is it always about women? <laughs> or why is it primarily about women? And um, because uh, there is a pattern uh, to uh, much of these, you know, call them ethno cultural religious encounters. Uh, Gayatri Spivak once said, rather um, <laughs> brashly, <laughs> she said, a lot of um, uh, uh, discourse um, is about uh, white men saving brown women from brown men, right? This was her way of you know, talking about the language of universalism, anti-imperialism, anti-colonialism. Uh, there is there is something something uh, to it, in the sense that um, uh, in this in this context, it seems that in a strange way, uh, women's bodies become simply the sites of this kind of symbolic encounter. I mean, recall the 19th century discussion about the sati in this you know in Britain. And you know, and uh, the the way in which all of a sudden, sati became representative of everything that was regressive, 
and reactionary about you know Hindu uh, religion, and there was an attempt to try to find it in the in the books where actually uh, that's not the way Hindu religion, from what I can understand, at all works. It's not text centered, so there is no uh, textual justification for it one way or another. Just as you can parse the Quran in many ways to see if there is a textual justification for wearing the hijab, and most people will point you to the same one. Uh, so there, there is this general, general question about why uh, women and the regulation of their bodies assume such a prominent position, which then leads us to another um, observation that you made, uh, which is the difficult way in which um, Either today the the welfare state, because you know it's um, uh, one phrase for it was uh, in French. I know you use the term l'état provident. What was one from? But there's also the concept of the nanny state, right? Uh, is there a way in which the construction of the claims around social citizenship, in particular, is leading to the juridification uh, of domains of life? And therefore, you know, uh, all these phenomena are coming up with, you know, um, that are rattling, uh, as you point out, this, this sort of relationship between the political and the religious or the, the, the juridical political, you know, the juridical political and the, and the religious. So in that sense, I would say that uh, um, uh, these, uh, uh, these questions are really suggested also. By the, uh, by the current moment. And um, in an odd way, it is related to cosmopolitanism because part of uh, what uh, goes on in our, um, uh, in our context is uh, the, the very narrow space-time in which we have to renegotiate such fundamental differences. I mean, uh, I was thinking about um, the very bad picture that we have of the Enlightenment as a historical, simply Eurocentric, and so on. Enlightenment thinkers, I mean, you know, if you think Montaigne is part of the early Enlightenment, you know, Montesquieu, uh, Kant, they were really interested in comparative civilizational discourse. They tried to get their hands on everything that they could. And they were very interested uh, in understanding, in fact, the non-European world. In fact, if anything, there was a kind of um, um, a fixation on Oriental despotism, which at that time was even a positive, a positive concept. Uh, but uh, this uh, preoccupation with otherness uh, uh, that, that is part of the Cosmopolitan Project is, is always there. But, in our world, you know, it's like we are so compressed, you know, right? The metaphor is the airplane. You know, we have to negotiate our differences almost within the length of a flight. And that's what uh, creates, uh, creates the, the, the confusion. So final observation, is the scarf affair then in that sense about political uh, political theology, uh, not in the Schmittian sense, but in the more general sense of uh, maybe uh, uh, leading us to rethink what we have so much, you know, taken for granted, uh, you know, for so long. So, no substantive disagreement on this panel. <laughs> Good. Good, thank you. So, uh, I hope, despite the absence of disagreement, uh, we have some provocative comments on the floor is open. Uh, please. Anybody disagreeing? Yes, please. Or agreeing? Yeah. Very interesting in your chapter was the discussion of Republican uh, Turkish ideology and the construction. You said at one point, you know, they missed they missed a chance. But before you say they missed a chance, to change things or discuss the change that the uh, Republican ideology, in some ways, uh, the Muslim identifier became a form of uh, ethnic citizenship, which I found interesting, Turkish ethnic citizenship, in a country where you have you know, Kurds and so on. Um, and that, in some ways, you could extend that to Europe, this like, unspoken assumption um, in 
Britain, too, that in a certain sense, the unspoken assumption is that the ethnic citizenship of the English, in a way, even if you're not a member of it, is broad church Anglicanism. I mean, you don't have to be a member of it, but the tradition of it, or you think like that. Um, and uh, in France, curiously enough, although you think it's the lay tradition, if you scratch a bit, if you said to somebody who was lay after a few drinks, you know, if you weren't lay, what would you be? Well, you probably wouldn't say, I'm going to be um, Muslim, unless you come from that background, you probably say, well, I'd probably be Catholic. You see, there is that, and you, I think in France, if you look, you know, 50 years ago, 60 years, the whole question of the Jews gets you there, because the construction of Jews in France in the first half of this 20th century was those who had deep roots in France, and those who were the ethnic other, the Ostjuden, who came, which really you know, opened up in some ways, the, or from Alsace for them, opened up modern political anti-Semitism in France. Within a larger tradition, the, the Jews who live in France were accepted in that tradition. Uh, so that I'm, I'm, I'm like, what I, what, it just got us me thinking that, in a way, there's another discussion here. It's not about the state, and, uh, you know, but it's actually the whole question of the differences between Jus Soli and Jus Sanguinis fed through this religious debate. I mean, it's like two or three times removed, but somewhere there is that, especially in Europe, that that, you know, that was the, the if you dig d deep enough, if people are just thinking, are not thinking consciously, that in some way is still the kind of default position. And underneath all of this is still that, that somehow all these states are ethnically defined through this kind of shared religious experience, although it's not articulated. And the other point of all, of course, is that you know, uh, European states will never call themselves immigration states, you know, that that's not the definition of it. So if you go to the United States, maybe if you dub deep enough, you would say it isn't Christianity, but religion. In other words, you couldn't be president of the United States in the 21st century, alone, maybe in the 18th you could if you were Thomas Jefferson, and say, I'm not religious. I mean, you get, as long as you're a believer in something that's religious <coughs> and divine, you're probably okay. But to say that you're an atheist, for instance, would be deeply un-American. You wouldn't get many votes. So, I mean, I think, I'm not sure where I'm getting here, but I think that's the part that I'd like to see discussed. Not this, you know, the Schmidt thing about the political uh, theology, but the other side of it, which I think is exposed in this discussion, in your chapter, by the way, I think, very well. Um, um, maybe Catherine would like, you know, to... Cecile, you know, pardon, I'm interested. And, um, uh, the, um, this is showing sort of the interrelationship, you know, of um, uh, categories of uh, uh, citizenship, um, ethnocultural identity, you know, religion and the way in which they can be uh, either so taken for granted or so uh, they become you know so fluid I actually do uh, believe that in this respect Turkey and France uh, are on one side um, and um, uh, countries like uh, Germany uh, Israel are on the other with countries like you know Greece also closer to the your sanguinous model and I believe that you know liberal ideals of citizenship the modern state had competing and different ideals of citizenship um, my colleague Roger Smith has a very good book about varieties of American citizenship competing ideals of American citizenship the Ataturk model was really Republican citizenship of course, and uh, this may seem like a bad, uh, like a big, of course, uh, uh, I mean, uh, this is a very complex question, but I do want to say it in the name of, you know, historical correctness. Even after the Armenian genocide, in which, of course, Ataturk was not a party, was not involved in it, there is debate about what he should have, could have, may have done. Even after that, the surviving, uh, Armenian ethnics on the territory of Republican Turkey were granted citizenship. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's an important point you know to remember. All non-Muslims, as well as Muslims within the boundaries of the Republic after 1923, after the Lausanne Sevres agreements, were granted citizenship. This is the ideal of you know Republican 
citizenship, the ideals with which I was brought up in public schools. But there was always also another argument, not necessarily in his writings, and he's a very complex figure, about the ethnic core of the nation. And you find this more or less. And um, I mean, I think that in France, and uh, Turkey was built on the French model. This ideal of uh, uh, Republican citizenship dominated uh, uh, until, very, until very recently. The nationalist discourse was never lost. Now, what I discuss in this chapter was um, uh, that moment when um, uh, Article 10 uh, of uh, the Turkish uh, Constitution, which uh, concerns um, uh, uh, public schools and language, you know, the education in, in public schools, etc. When uh, the issue was whether the pluralism, that's my interpretation, of the AKP was not just going to be the religious, the laic religious uh, split, but whether this pluralism could be extended far enough to take into account other kinds of ethnocultural cleavages in the understanding of citizenship. It's turned out that you know I was wrong. And just one other uh, point. Are in France, uh, the women or the young women and girls who are wearing the hijab, because the numbers are declining now, but we don't know what's going on privately. Were they grandchildren of migrants who came from Algeria in particular, or Morocco? Or that, why does one always talk about them as if they were migrants and just like almost arrived you know, 15 or 16 <coughs> years later? So even the language in which we talk about this um, you know, sort of, um, um, how shall I put it, uh, um, extends and enhances the process of othering, right? So religion f is for those over, for those over, you know, there, you know, it's, uh, uh, well, a lot could be said about, you know, about the United States, you know, which is an exception to much of this conversation because of its unique, uh, the unique position of the First Amendment. Uh, I mean, uh, let me um, uh, just say this. Uh, the United States is really quite exemplary in this way because uh, although there has been some workplace discrimination against you know, uh, Muslims and some security-related uh, uh, stuff, uh, this is not an issue. So here briefly then. Oh, sure. Uh, just uh, very briefly, just pick up a few points that were, that were made. Um, because of um, just on the comparison between France and Turkey, I think it's easy to exaggerate the similarities because, as you reminded us, uh, Turkey was influenced by a French model. And because now, on the hijab affairs, they seem to go in the same direction in the, in the, in the decision that have been taken on, on hijab. But I think there's, there's a strong difference between a system that is a, a liberal, secularist state and a system which I think was the Ataturk state, which was not a liberal secularist system. And I think that tends to be, the comparison between France and Turkey tends to uh, underestimate this. On the ethno-cultural dimension of uh, secularism, it's face, it is strong in France, and this, there's a French term for it, which is catholicity. So it's a, it's a laicity that's like, in fact Catholic. So okay. At the same time, again, I think there's a tendency to exaggerate it and to come back to your point about Jews. I mean, we shouldn't forget that uh, Jews and Protestants were the strongest advocates of laicity in the late 19th century yeah. because laicity was seen as pr protecting and preserving the rights of minorities. On, uh, on the point that Sheila made earlier about <coughs> why, the, the, you know, why, why is it always about women? It's a very interesting question, and it's, it's, it's come very clearly in a colonial context. Again, we think this is new. This, we think it's all about post-colonial renegotiations. You know, white um, white men saving brown women from brown men. But um, there's a history to that um, during the colonial period itself. Right? But I think more generally, it seems to me that the reason why it's focused on women is because it's about reproduction of society. It's about ordered reproduction of, of a social order. And the difference between production and reproduction tends to be gendered, of course. So 
So if you look at the areas of social life that I mentioned as being the site of those conflicts, education, social work, the family, clearly in all of those, historically, women have played a traditional role. So women is seen as the group in society that allows the ordered reproduction of society, and that's why religious groups always had an interest. Uh, in controlling uh, women and, and so have secular states. And finally, on the last point you were raising about the othering of uh, uh, the Muslim women in France, um, you're right. What's very interesting, as you point out, is most of, the, most of them are second or third generation migrants, so they're not really migrants in any meaningful sense, and they see themselves as French primarily. What they want to, what they want to do is to show that you can be both French and Muslim. a citizen if you were 
you know, a cat, you know, a face. So descriptively, this thesis, you know, strikes me as being quite correct for many, many countries. Again, it wasn't also correct for Turkish modernity because despite uh, the universal category of citizenship, <coughs> the category of religion was very much dirigiste, if I can use this. You had different communities of faith, and the Muslim community of faith was the, officially the state educates. There, there are state institutions that educate the, you know, the, the hojas and the imams, and that means that, you know, that actually there's a ministry of religious affairs which recognizes that this is the majority religion and the minority religions have their own limited autonomy, you know, the synagogues and the churches, but basically, you know, the people, the muezzin and the hojas are educated. Right? So this is then, you know, again, a completely different model. It is a model of, you know, quasi-Protestantization of the public sphere. The public sphere is supposed to be pure and open to all, but, you know, the state still has its quasi-control over who gets to say what, you know, uh, all across, you know, the country on for Friday, for Friday prayer, prayers. It's, it's a fascinating set of... Um, a uh, set of issues and, you know, problems that, that sort of come in along with this. Yeah. Yeah. I have a lot to say about what you all said, but I can give it to you. To your, to your point, or to the one that Leo, uh, Leo made. Um, can I think about it before? And, uh, you go ahead. also a more psychoanalytic probably point that identity claims have so much to do with uh, uh, the earliest memories you know for which you know and the break of the impression for which still uh, women um, are uh, the principal actors that uh, any discussion about identity seems to invoke uh, also uh, this uh, this question particularly the, uh, uh, the identity of uh, the woman who takes care of you. This is uh, uh, 
uh, clearly, I think that um, an important psychoanalytic insight that was already there, you know, since the Beauvoir and so on. But what is difficult is um, the conversation that one needs to have uh, about practices that are clearly uh, anti-human rights. Uh, what maybe Susan Oaken, uh, the late Susan Oaken, called about 20 years ago in a very bluntly named article, is multiculturalism bad for women? And uh, I think it's a difficult conversation. I think it's an important conversation. And I certainly uh, uh, you know, have uh, entered these uh, debates uh, uh, not uh, uh, giving up my feminism and my commitment to women's rights. I mean, I entered this debate precisely because I think it is a conversation in particular that women need to have. Uh, the difficulty is that if you want to talk about uh, um, honor killing female uh, genital mutilation or female circumcision and we start debating about what to call it and how to call it and so on. Uh, the dominant discourse <coughs> criminalizes the marginalized other <coughs> in virtue of this. Even the dominant liberal discourse does that. So it's very difficult but it is necessary uh, as you know, political agents and as you know, um, universalist thinkers, to find that space of conversation where you should be able to critique and also engage in solidarity without marginalization and without criminalization. Just a very brief point about to come back to the. To the point about uh, political theology, because we, we've had a very a very fair but a very strict chairman, and as a result, I had to cut what I was saying at the end, so they gives me the uh, opportunity to... Uh, yeah, only two minutes left. Oh, oh yeah, I'll, be, I'll, I'll, I'll take 45 seconds. Um, so, well, one thing I wanted to say that in the, in the penultimate section was, I do think there is something to, to the thesis, and more or less along the lines that you were suggesting, so I didn't have time to, to say it, but, um, but my, the, 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 my stance on this at the moment is, there might be something to the thesis, but to operationalize it, I think we need something, we need a, a more fine-tuned and a, actually a disaggregated conception of, of religion, because what, what I think one of the problems with political theology is, is that he employs just exactly the vague categories that he, he thinks secular thought operates with. He simply reproduces them without interrogating them. So one of the charges that political theology thinkers often make of liberalism is to say, well, liberalism is just a religion. Right? It's just, that's, that's the kind of cliche of political theology. Well, in a certain sense, that's probably true. In certain dimensions of liberalism are like religion. So you might think, well, liberalism is a shared moral ideal it could be the bond that can help hold together a diverse society, it can be an article of faith, it can be an, even an official orthodoxy. So in all this limited sense, it might just be the case that liberalism is a, is a religion. But there are other senses of religion. Right? It's, it, and it's in relation to those other senses that we talk about separation between the state and the religion. So I think the thought here that the only way to salvage this Schmittian thesis is to produce a disaggregated conception of religion. Thank you very much to both for both speakers for this uh, discussion and uh